Hey friends, today I've got something especially frightening to talk to you about. Did you know that every single hour of every single day, one man around the world is diagnosed with testicular cancer? It's the news that no man ever wants to hear, a silent killer. And for this video, I'm partnering with Manscaped to spread the news that April is National Testicular Cancer Awareness Month. Cancer prevention screening is a crucial part of all our lives. And for us men, nothing makes it easier to check for any unwanted lumps or growths like proper manscaping. And nothing makes manscaping easier than the Lawn Mower 4.0. It's the perfect tool to aid in simple, routine self-checks at home, as the Lawn Mower Skin Safe technology allows a close shave without the risk of nasty nicks and cuts. Then when you're done, performing that crucial home screening is as easy as can be. So to make it so much simpler to check yourself for early signs of cancer, get your hands on the Lawn Mower 4.0. And to make it even easier for members of the Buttersock Cult, you can use the code Let's Read at checkout to get 20% off as well as free worldwide shipping at manscaped.com. And don't forget to visit manscaped.com TCS to learn more about how to check yourself or even make a donation to the Testicular Cancer Society today to save lives and balls. Back when I was 19, me and a few mates decided on a little lad's holiday to Malaysia. We packed up some things, booked some flights to Kuala Lumpur, and set off on what we thought was going to be the adventure of a lifetime. We only wanted to stay for a week, do some drinking, see some sights, chat to some girls. It was supposed to be a dream holiday for us, but for me personally it ended up being an absolute nightmare. I haven't really got a bad word to say about Malaysia. I want to make that clear and everyone but a handful of Malays I met were great folks. And despite it actually being me who's one of the idiots in the story, I'm not evil but I definitely shared a space with some people who were. So, like I said, there's a big chance you're not going to have any sympathy for me here because I'm one of the villains of the story. Not nearly as much as a villain as some others, but a villain nonetheless. You see, I got flirting with this Malay girl who turned out to have a boyfriend. And when the boyfriend started giving it the big one, I gave him a slap that would have impressed Will Smith. Wink, wink. He hits me back. I throw him over a table and before my mates got involved and dragged me off the bloke, I got a few decent hits in on him. I was drunk as a skunk at the time and I've had plenty of fisticuffs back in Oz with people just going their separate ways after a bit of a scuffle. And then the next thing I know, as we're leaving the bar, the Malaysian cops show up and practically everyone spills out of the bar to be like, him, he was the one fighting, arrest him. And believe me, arrest me they did. I won't go through the ins and outs of the court case but let's just say that I didn't have a leg to stand on. The whole thing was caught on CCTV and as much as my lawyer and the bloke from the Aussie consulate tried to barter my sentence down to deportation, I ended up getting four months in Kajang prison. I cried like a baby that first night on remand as I'd gotten into my head that Kajang would be some kind of torture that I'd never make it out alive from. But honestly, I think it was a bit of prejudice speaking because the prison itself didn't turn out to be all that bad. Yeah, it was grim, but if you kept your head down, behaved yourself, and didn't have sticky fingers, you got along quite well. But if you didn't behave, if you stole from your fellow prisoners and made their lives difficult, they made your life difficult in turn, and that's a lesson that a Nigerian bloke learned a hundred times over. I was probably just as surprised as you are to find out that there was a little Nigerian contingent in a Malay prison, but so there was. All these big scary looking blokes too. You couldn't have wanted to be facing them in a scrum, not even on your best day. But from what I came to understand, they were having trouble with one of their own and this one turned out to be a much smaller one who had a habit of going on the take. He'd steal from everyone. The Malays, the Indos in the kitchen, even his own Nigerian brothers and in the end, some Malay gangsters got right bloody sick of it and decided to teach him a lesson. They just didn't do it somewhere private either, shanking him in the showers or however they'd like to do it in America. The Malay Mafia 
did it at a time and place where everyone would be able to see what happens to thieves, and they did it in a way that meant no one could touch them for it. I remember the sound of it like it was yesterday. We're all in the canteen, and I was part of the second sitting, meaning the second group of prisoners that were allowed into the canteen to eat. Then out of nowhere, I hear the single most blood-curdling scream that's ever graced my ears. The only thing I can compare it to was when Andy Durrell broke his femur playing footy in grade 9. It was like a bloody great wail that came from the kitchens in the back, one that rose up in pitch and intensity until everyone in the canteen was grimacing just from the sound of it. It had that real nails on a chalkboard effect too, like it made me want to plug my ears just to keep from hearing it. It just didn't stop either. The screams kept going, on and on, like whatever was going on back in the kitchen, someone was in a lot of pain. The screws basically ran back into the kitchen to see what was going on, and everyone was looking over to the kitchen entrance, and that was at the side of the serving counter wanting to know just what had made someone scream like that. A few seconds later, they lead the thieving Nigerian bloke out, who was holding his arms out in front of them, and Jesus Christ... I've never seen burns so bad on anyone or anything. Up to about the middle of his forearms, all of his skin was blistered and peeling, like it literally looked deep fried. And the whole time he was being let out of the canteen, he was letting out this horrible mixture of screams and wails like he was literally crying like a baby shouting, Look what they did to me! Look what they did to me! He was quickly followed by the head of the kitchen team who ironically was the least supervised crew in the whole prison. You'd think that they'd have more supervision considering they had access to knives and pans and all that, but no. It was one of the cushiest jobs for that exact reason. The kitchen team were also made up of almost entirely of Malay Mafia guys, mainly because they could organize things to be smuggled into the prison in the food deliveries they received. So, the bloke that headed up the kitchen team, he was pretty high up in the Malay Mafia hierarchy from what I understand and it was him that came out of the kitchen with a big smile on his face, saying something in Malay to one of the guards. I turned to the bloke next to me and asked what was being said, and was told the guy was saying, He had an accident, boss. He slipped on some oil. But as any of you can probably guess, the guy hadn't slipped at all. I later heard, and I don't know how true this is, that they invited him into the kitchen so he could get some extra food, and he'd promised to stop stealing stuff if he could get some extras. And little did he know, the Nigerian guys had basically okayed him getting punished from the Malays, probably just to keep them sweet since they had a little smuggling arrangement with them. Then, after getting the guy into the kitchen with the promise of extra food, they braced him, dragged him over to the deep fat fryer, then forced his arms into it while it was turned up high. Everyone else in the kitchen then swore blind that the whole thing had been an accident and that they had no idea what the guy was talking about when he said that he'd had his arms forced into the fryer. They had said that he'd slipped on some oil that had leaked out of the unit or something and the guards just ate it up. That was without a doubt the most terrifying thing I'd ever witnessed or heard about when I was inside and nothing else even compared to it. I sometimes still have nightmares where I can hear that guy screaming, and at one point, I even had a nightmare where it was me having my arms forced into the fryer. In a dream when I pulled my arms out of the thing, they looked like fried chicken, but all bloodied and melting too, if you can picture it. Even had the nightmares after I got out when my four-month stretch was finally over. I think it's because, since I was just waiting for something bad to happen the whole time, when it finally did and I saw it, I couldn't help but be like obsessive over it, if that makes sense. Getting back to Australia was just a dream, and the reunion with my parents was an emotional one, but intense affair. Mom said that she didn't know whether to smack me or hug me, but Dad later said that he knew boys would be boys, and that as much as I deserved to be kicked out with a lifetime ban or a fine or something, making an example out of me wasn't fair in the least bit. But anyway, lesson learned. And don't mess around in other countries, kids, because they don't mess around either.
I spent a few years inside on drug-related charges when I was younger, and let me tell you, prison is no joke. By the time I got out, I was all kinds of messed up, and I'm pretty sure I still got some kind of PTSD from some of the scary stuff that I saw. I saw a lot of violence, a lot of guys just being straight up evil to lesser, weaker dudes, but I think the thing that got me the most was how pointless and senseless a lot of it was. This one time I was playing cards with some guys and one of them was smoking a cigarette. This other dude, who wasn't playing with us, comes up to the table and asks the guy for shorts on it. Shorts means before you finish your cig, you can hand it off to someone else and they can get the last few drags on it before there's none left. The smoker agrees, but barely even looks up from the game. Then the other guy thanks him and then walks off. I think the smoker was just way too lost in the game and maybe figured the guy would be watching and then would come back once the cig was almost out. So he just carried on with his game, then when the cig was finished, he just flicked it and carried on playing. Stuff like that starts fights for sure, and I remember thinking like, uh-oh, that guy ain't gonna be happy. And lo and behold, minutes later, the guy comes back, sees the smoker isn't smoking anymore, and just asks him real cool like, he didn't save me no shorts? Again, the guy barely even looks up and just says, yes, yeah, sorry, then carries on putting down and picking up cards after telling him he should come back for the next one. The guy seemed kind of angry, but... He just nods like, alright, and then walks off like he's going to look for another guy to call shorts on, as I said. About a half hour goes by, then the smoker takes his pack out, pulls another cig, and then lights up. I look up in time to see the same shorts guy walking over, figuring he was about to ask for shorts again. Only, when he gets behind the smoker, he doesn't ask him anything. He just grabs the guy by the chin, pulls his head back, and start shanking him in the throat with what I figured was a pen or pencil that he'd somehow managed to sharpen. We only get blunt stuff to write with, go figure, but somehow this guy must have been sharpening it against something, God knows what, because he was shanking this guy over and over and over again that blood was just bubbling out all down his neck and onto his shirt. Obviously, we all jumped up, while people are calling out for the CEOs and then a bunch of them in riot gear showed up and just unleashed the works on him. Pepper spray, tasers, batons. I mean, they beat the life out of this guy even after he just got on his knees and surrendered. The medics got to the guy who had been shanked way, way after he needed them. They can't come into an area like that until all the threats have been dealt with. So, honestly, I think the guy bled out before they even got to him because... We heard a few days later that he'd been taken to the morgue almost straight from the prison hospital. And stuff like that, all combined from my years there, ended up just making me really tense all the time. Constant anxiety. And for a long time, any kind of sharp object had me panicking like someone was going to use it on me. I knew they weren't, but it's just my brain was just in war mode all the time, ready to fight or flight even though I knew I was safely out of lockup. I guess that's what I mean about prison being no joke. You don't ever really get out, not unless you're one of those psychos who lives for that kind of lifestyle. I knew of a few guys inside who were just like that, just doing dumb petty stuff on the outside just to get back into lockup with their homies. They said they never meant to get caught, but then they used to roll around gangbanging just not caring and then acted all happy when they got back inside with their respective gang. People were crazy, man. Like, seriously crazy, and since I got out, I decided that lifestyle just wasn't for me. My job sucks now. I legit work at an Amazon center right now, and it's incredibly boring and tedious. But man, it pays the bills, and working with boring civilians is something that never makes me feel like I'm in danger, really, ever. Danger of getting fired sometimes, sure. But at least I can sleep at night not having to worry about getting shanked. My brother spent some time in the county a few years back and said it was the worst time of his life. I asked him what the worst thing that happened to him was and he said he didn't want to talk about it but he did tell me this one story that just might be one of the most messed up things I've ever heard. 
The thing that gets me about it is that it actually starts off kind of funny. I mean, not for the dude it's about, but you'll see what I mean. And then it goes from something you tell as a funny story to something you tell as a straight up horror story. Hence why I'm sending this in. It goes from 0 to 100 in just seconds, and I get why he would be shook up about seeing it. So my brother said that a few months into his stretch, the guy across from him has this new Sally move in with him. The guy seemed cool at first, but in work with the woods and stuff, but then one day he starts ripping these powerful farts, incredibly loud too. My brother and his cellmate think this is kind of hilarious, and so does the other guy for about a minute. But then, the way my brother tells it, the farting guy was pumping out gas that smelled like a raccoon crawled up his butt and died. I mean, they were so bad that even my brother and his cellmate were telling him to stick a cork up it or something because they were so bad that they were stinking up the whole block. Guys from like four or five cells down were calling out like, put some water on that, thinking that he'd use the bathroom, but they were just legitimately only farts. It got to the point where everyone in the block was walking around with towels or shirts over their faces just to keep the smell out of their noses. It was seriously that bad. At some point, the farting guy's Sally asks him about what the deal was with his butt, and the other guy says that he was on some special dietary needs that the county couldn't accommodate. Like he tried sticking to just vegetables and stuff, but even then, it didn't seem to help. Dude just keeps ripping these heinous farts all day and all night. Like I said, people just thought it was kind of funny at first, but then after a while, people started getting real sick of the stench and no one was more sick of it than the guy's cellmate. Then, one night, the guy just turns feral on the farter, and my brother said that he woke up to the sickening crunching sound coming from the cell opposite his. He sits up, and he's peering through the darkness trying to work out what he can hear half asleep, and then he just about makes out the guy opposite, just like stomping on something. He knew what was going on, but he didn't want to call the guards and be a snitch like that. He just waited until one started walking the rows and raised the alarm. The guy had been literally stomping a hole in his celly's head after pulling him out of his bunk, and when he got wheeled out on the stretcher, his head was just a mess of blood and swollen facial features. And my brother said that he was certain that the guy was dead, but... Somehow, he actually survived the insane amount of punishment he got. I use that term survived real loose though because my brother said a word got back to the block that the guy had brain damage and was being moved to a specialist hospital upstate. He said the even crazier thing was how blood was on the floor of the cell when the medics came to take the farting guy away. He said it was like all the blood in the guy's body was just sitting there in a pool. It was unreal to think so much of it had just straight up come out of the guy's head and even crazier to think that he actually survived having bled out so much. He said it started to clot on the floor too, so when the attacker got carted out of the cell by the COs and the cleaners came in to mop it up, it was thick like sludge on the cell floor. All that just over farts though. I get it. It would get really annoying after a while, but the guy couldn't help it, could he? Poor dude couldn't handle the terrible jail food and it almost cost him his life. And if he ended up getting really badly brain damaged, that's pretty much his life over, isn't it? And stuff like that just reminds me of how, as tough as I like to think I am, I'd never last in prison or the county. For some people, it's a death sentence without ever getting one, and I think I might be one of those people that applies to. Ever see the old HBO show Oz? To this day, it's my favorite TV show ever, and back in my late teens and early 20s, it was solely responsible for me wanting to work as a correctional officer. It might sound a little dumb to you because it definitely sounds dumb when I think about it these days, but I figured those guys were like the toughest SOBs on the face of the earth. They dealt with the worst of the worst every single day of their lives, mad dogging serial murders just to keep them in line literally going one-on-one -on -one with some absolute monsters sometimes and being tough enough to come out on top. To me, they seem like the special forces of the law enforcement world. Not out there helping old ladies cross the street or chasing down kids on stolen bikes, but 
keeping the likes of El Chapo or Charlie Manson locked up and away from the civilized world. I mean, that's as noble a profession as ever there was one, right? And I still think the same thing today to an extent. But there was a lot about being a CEO that I didn't figure until I was actually doing the job. And let me tell you, it's never the drug traffickers or serial killers that actually keep you up at night. It's guys like the one I have to tell you about in my story here. So, this one night, way back when I was still going through my on-the-job training, I had to go pull a shift in the medical ward. But I have to make something clear here. The medical ward is not the hospital, and a better name for it would be the psych unit or mental health unit or something, because it's the place we kept the guys who weren't mentally well enough to be around other regular prisoners. Each inmate had their own isolated cell, and were only let out twice a day to eat and to exercise and never around the general population. That night I was shadowing the unit's nurse while she was doing her rounds, which mostly involved doing welfare checks and giving out the appropriate medicines to all the various prisoners. Then, we get this one prisoner's cell, and the second I unlocked the door and opened it, I was almost knocked out onto my butt by the most stomach-turning smell I'd ever smelled in my life. Like I knew at the time it was fecal matter, but there's a huge difference between a fresh dump and the kind of stuff that had been plastered in this guy's butt for maybe two or three days at that point. The nurse knew better than to go in without protection too. She told me after that that she always dabbed a little Vaseline in her nostrils before making the rounds, that way she couldn't smell a thing. Anyway, once we were done handing out the medicine, I walked right up to my training officer and asked him what the deal was with the prisoner who smelled like a sewage drain. I expected him to just burst out laughing at me, which had so far been his textbook response for almost every dumb or ignorant question that had come out of my mouth. To the older guys, it was fun for them to see a youngster all horrified over all the stuff they'd dealt with for years, but then it came to the human sewage pipe. For some reason, it was nothing to laugh about. My trainer just kind of sighed, spun around in his chair and said something like, So, you finally met Marshall then, huh? He then explained that smelling bad was kind of his thing, and that as much as the medical team had tried to coach him out of it, he seemed to despise being clean. Whenever they did manage to talk him into showering or whatever, he acted like he was on the verge of a panic attack until he finally got a chance to soil himself again. Then I made the mistake of asking why he always went to the bathroom on himself. My trainer explained that in the prison that he was held in before the one I worked at, he was repeatedly attacked and how do I put this, violated by other prisoners. Lick repeatedly targeted in the showers until he finally found a novel way of keeping his attackers off him. If he made himself a walking biohazard, the people who were targeting him suddenly weren't so keen on attacking him anymore, and I guess he lived like that for so long in the safety of his own filth that it took on like a comforting psychological effect for him. I remember saying something like, huh. Poor guy, no wonder he's so screwed up. My trainer almost spat his coffee out before telling me I wouldn't have any sympathy for the guy if I knew what his conviction was. Turned out, he was a serial child abuser. And that was the reason he'd had a target painted on his back in the first place. He was right. I didn't have any sympathy for him after that. And it made it all the creepier that he liked to use little kid's language whenever he spoke to any of the staff or COs. Like instead of saying that he, you know, soiled himself or whatever, he would say things like, I went potty on myself. Like if the guy had straight up learning difficulties or whatever, I'd maybe understand, but the CEO said Marshall was way more devious and evil than he'd like to make out. He was a master manipulator and a complete psychopath who didn't care about anyone but himself. Worst job in the whole prison was undoubtedly the cleaners who had to hose down Marshall's room every few days. The first year I was there, we had six different cleaners just refuse to do the job, even when they were offered what amounted to chemical warfare suits to get the job done safely. All six then quit when they were told that they had to do it or face getting fired. That was six in the first year alone and by this point I've literally lost count of the numbers of cleaners who've quit because of Marshall and his unique self-defense techniques. Those are the kind of prisoners they never tell you about during the recruitment phase, 
and when you see them in the movies or TV shows, plenty of psycho prisoners on Oz for example, you always just think it's some kind of dumb Hollywood exaggeration to make the drama more intense or something. But sometimes, you meet a prisoner that could be the star of their own horror movie. And to me and most of the other COs too, Marshall was that prisoner. In the words of the infamous and multiple prison escapee Richard Lee McNair, thank God for prisons. There are some very sick people in them, animals you would never want living near your family or the public in general. I don't know how correction staff deal with it. They get spit on, abused, and I have seen them risk their own lives and save a prisoner many times. Never was a truer word spoken, and the United States has had its fair share of vicious and dangerous prisoners, and arguably none were more bloodthirsty or more deadly than a monster by the name of Thomas Silverstein. Silverstein was born to a divorced mother in Long Beach, California on February 4th of 1952. His mother, Virginia Conway, divorced Silverstein's biological father while he was still in the womb, and then married and eventually divorced another man before settling with a one Sid Silverstein, from whom Thomas inherited his surname. Silverstein grew up as a shy, awkward, and timid child who was often severely bullied by his middle-class neighbors. Not only was he singled out as a lower-class child of divorce, but his adopted second name meant that he was often mistaken for being Jewish, which meant that Thomas became the victim of some unforgivably vicious anti-Semitic comments. When Silverstein would arrive home in tears seeking comfort from his mother, she would rebuke his innocent vulnerability and demand that he take violent revenge on those that had wronged him. Then, when Thomas refused to partake in such hideous retribution, she told him that if he ever came running home to her again, crying because he had been beaten up by a bully, she would be waiting to beat him up even worse than they had. Silverstein later said that, It's how my mom was. She stood her mud. If someone came at you with a bat, you got your bat, and you both went at it. Following this cruel ultimatum, Silverstein committed his first act of violence, beating one of his bullies to a bloody pulp in the street outside his home. When she found out, his mother actually expressed approval of the act, and once the young man felt the warmth of his mother's pride in him, a life of violence was simply inevitable. At the tender age of 14, Silverstein was sent to the first of many correctional facilities after a conviction for violent conduct. It was there, at a California Youth Authority reformatory, that his attitude towards violence was harshly and definitively tempered. Life inside was dog-eat-dog, -dog, a constant fight for survival, and as Silverstein later put it, anyone not willing to fight was abused. Later in 1971, a 19-year-old Silverstein was sent to San Quentin Prison in California for armed robbery. It was around this time that he fell under the influence of his mother's second husband, Thomas Conway, himself an accomplished armed robber who schooled him in the tricks of the trade. Just months after he was paroled for his first armed robbery conviction, Silverstein was sent back to prison with his father and cousin after being convicted of three separate armed robberies that netted a paltry $11,000. The cycle repeated itself in 1977, and just months after he was paroled from that second conviction, Thomas was convicted for his part in an even more violent and terrifying armed robbery. And given that he was an unrepentant recidivist, he was sentenced to 15 years in Leavenworth's federal penitentiary. It was at Leavenworth that Silverstein first met members of the infamous Aryan Brotherhood, and being the viciously violent and hardened criminal that he was, the Brotherhood's leadership was deeply impressed with him. When the year 1980 rolled around, Silverstein was offered full membership to the Aryan Brotherhood, but he was required to prove his loyalty by spilling the blood of another prisoner. The Brotherhood had asked a young man named Danny Atwell to serve as a heroin mule for them, which would require him secreting drugs inside himself in order to transport them to another part of the prison. The drug trade was extremely lucrative to the Brotherhood, and they mostly relied on narcotic sales to fund their operations both in and out of the penitentiary. 
Few prisoners ever refused the wishes of the Brotherhood. To their surprise, Danny Atwell flat out refused to run the risk of an extended sentence for them. Such a refusal was a grave insult to the Brotherhood's leadership, so in response, they decided that Atwell had to be killed, and the man to do the job would be none other than Thomas Silverstein. Silverstein knew that the chances of him being caught and convicted of murder were extremely high, but given that, by that point, he saw no other life for himself outside of prison, he accepted. He then talked his way into Atwell's cell on the pretense of getting him out of trouble, then cut the poor soul's throat with a homemade knife that the Brotherhood had provided him with. As he expected, Silverstein was quickly apprehended, and after a swift trial, he was sentenced to life before being transferred to a United States penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. While incarcerated at Marion, Silverstein's behavior took a distinct turn for the worse. He was now a full-blooded member of the Aryan Brotherhood, one of the most violently racist prison gangs in American history, and his behavior reflected that enormously. He became so violent and disruptive that prison staff were forced to house him in the penitentiary's control unit, a sequestered area of the prison with a regimen that verged on constant solitary confinement. After tricking prison staff into thinking that he had somewhat reformed himself, Silverstein used his newfound freedom to assassinate an African-American prison gang member named Robert Chappelle, who was a veteran of an organization known as the DC Blacks. Once again, Silverstein's involvement in the murder was swiftly uncovered by the prison staff, and he was handed yet another life sentence. When word reached the leadership of the DC Blacks that Silverstein had murdered one of their own, it came to pass that the national leader of the gang, Raymond Cadillac Smith, ended up getting transferred to Marion Penitentiary, specifically to the control unit that housed Silverstein. It's not clear whether this was pure coincidence or some deliberately antagonistic power play instigated by federal penitentiary staff, but what's clear is that two men who shouldn't have been anywhere near each other ended up just a few feet apart. As prison logs would later confirm, Cadillac Smith spent most every hour of every day either plotting or attempting to murder Silverstein. Thomas, on the other hand, chose to sow seeds of doubt and conspiracy in Smith's mind, insisting he was completely innocent of the charge and that internal strife with the DC Blacks was to blame for Chappelle's murder. But Smith wasn't fooled, and as Silverstein would later state, everyone knew what was going on and no one did anything to keep us apart. The guards wanted one of us to kill the other. Silverstein believed that someone, high up in the ranks of the penitentiary's leadership, had engineered his and Smith's close proximity, and that it was only a matter of time before mortal combat ensued. They proved him right. Somehow, Silverstein and Smith ended up face to face, with each in possession of improvised weapons, it's not clear if Smith finally found a window of opportunity to attack Silverstein or if the guards arranged for them to be alone together, but after a lengthy struggle, Silverstein came out on top, having stabbed Smith more than 60 times in the torso, neck, and face. Only once Smith was dead, Silverstein didn't try to remove himself from the situation. After all, it was a hard-fought victory, one that had been a long time coming. He ended up dragging Smith's bloodied corpse up and down the cell block, showing off his trophy to his fellow prisoners, and hallowing about how he just slaughtered the DC Black's longtime leader. The murder ended up with Silverstein receiving yet another life sentence, and this time, it was without the possibility of parole. By 1983, Silverstein had firmly established his reputation as one of the worst prisoners in the entire country. He hated the correctional officers, and they hated him in turn. But one officer in particular despised Silverstein with a passion, and dedicated a great deal of his time to making his life torture. Some say that correctional officer Merle Klutz deliberately harassed Silverstein for almost a year, doing anything and everything he could to make his life harder than it had to be. In one instance, Klutz was said to have entered Silverstein's cell while he was painting, Silverstein's only creative outlet, and one he seemed to treasure beyond words. After making a few derisive comments on his artistic skills, 
Klutz apparently took down a few of Silverstein's paintings and tore them up right there in front of him. Silverstein was apoplectic with rage, yet he had no recourse whatsoever. If he killed a prison guard, he would surely get the death penalty, and although Silverstein feared very little in life, he feared death. Yet as the harassment continued, day after day, week after week, Silverstein found that he had less and less to lose. If Klutz was determined to take everything away from him, then he'd find a way to take everything from Klutz in turn. Then, on October 22nd of 1983, Klutz let Silverstein out of his cell to take a shower. As they walked, Silverstein began limping and complained to Klutz that he was in serious pain. Klutz harbored no sympathy and kept on walking, telling Silverstein that he had a set amount of time to wash and would not be waited for. Yet as Klutz passed Silverstein in the hallway, he fell into a carefully planned trap of the murderer's creation. Silverstein stopped outside the cell of another inmate, who unlocked his handcuffs with a homemade key and handed him a prison shank, all in one fluid motion. Silverstein then kept his hands firmly behind his back as he continued to limp towards an ever-impatient Klutz. Then in one fell swoop, he pounced. Klutz was stabbed so many times that he was dead before his fellow correctional officers could even restrain his attacker. Then minutes later, the entirety of Marion Penitentiary was placed on an indefinite lockdown, which ultimately lasted for 23 years. Klutz's murder had sent shockwaves through the prison staff community, and tens of thousands of them wrote letters to the Department of Corrections demanding safer working conditions for themselves and their colleagues. As a result, a brand new kind of federal prison was designed, one that would be christened Super Maximum Security. The first of its kind was Florence Penitentiary in Colorado, and one of the first inmates transferred there was none other than the prisoner who inspired its design. Thomas Silverstein. Following Klutz's murder and prior to his transfer to Florence Supermax Prison, Silverstein was transferred to a United States penitentiary in Atlanta, where he was placed in complete solitary confinement. A note on his file specified that he was to have no human contact due to the danger he presented to the correctional officers. Silverstein later claimed that this no-human-contact status was basically a form of legalized torture reserved for those who had killed correctional officers. This prompted a Bureau of Prisons official to publicly state that when an inmate kills a guard, he must be punished. We can't execute Silverstein, so we have no choice but to make his life torture. Otherwise, other inmates will kill guards too. There has to be some supreme punishment. Every convict knows what Silverstein is going through. We want them to realize that if they cross the line that he did, they will pay a heavy price. If this story hasn't quite made it clear how completely evil Thomas Silverstein was, let this last anecdote put it beyond all doubt. During the 1987 Atlanta prison riots, Cuban prisoners released Silverstein from his isolation cell as a method of terrifying the correctional officer hostages they'd taken. As a result, Thomas was able to roam freely about the prison and threatened to execute the Cubans' hostages on a number of separate occasions. When they refused him access to them, Silverstein threatened to kill them too and hurled racial abuse at the Cubans until they turned on him and took him as a hostage too. As a show of good faith, the Cubans then handed Silverstein over to the FBI's hostage rescue team who considered Silverstein's recapture as a landmark moment in the quelling of the disturbance. Just consider how abhorrent an inmate has to be for their fellow prisoners to attack them, tie them up, and hand them over to the federal government during a prison riot. When that type of contempt is comprehended, then you have an idea of how other hardened criminals felt about Thomas Silverstein, who was without a shadow of a doubt one of the most vicious and violent prisoners in United States history. In the end, Silverstein's life would end as the result of a sharp implement, just not in the same way you might expect. He died on May 11th of 2019 at St. Anthony's Hospital in Lakewood, Colorado after suffering complications following heart surgery. He spent an incredible 36 years in solitary confinement, but shockingly, that's not even the record for the longest a U.S. prisoner has spent in such conditions. 
There are plenty of debates over who served the longest in solitary confinement, and many of these arguments hinge on whether the confinement was cumulative or concurrent. But one thing is clear. Thomas Silverstein deserved every moment he spent deprived of human contact. Those who relinquish their humanity deserve nothing less. If I asked you to list the most bloodthirsty British criminals of all time, whose names would you give me? Perhaps you'd say Ian Brady, Dennis Nilsson, Fred West, or even Victorian London's own Jack the Ripper. There are most definitely other names which belong on that list, but one that seems to be continuously neglected, unknown to even the most ardent true crime aficionados, is that of Robert John Maudsley. Robert was born on June 26 of 1953 into a family of 14 in the English city of Liverpool. Due to the immense number of siblings he had, Robert's parents were almost completely incapable of feeding or clothing him due to crushing financial constraints. This led to him being placed in a Catholic orphanage in the nearby village of Crosby, as local authorities quickly established that not only was Robert being maltreated in his parents' care, but he was also being abused by his father and older siblings. Around the time of Robert's eighth birthday, his father approached the orphanage with proof that he was financially capable of caring for the boy. He had recently been promoted at work, and the additional income made him eligible to apply for custody. A short time later, the orphanage returned Robert to the care of his family, but this only meant that the disgusting abuse could resume, and this time, it was far worse than it had been previously. The abuse soon came to the attention of Liverpool's Department of Social Services, who intervened on Robert's behalf and once again removed him from his parents' care. Moldsley would later state that this constant instability, coupled with incessant abuse at the hands of his own parents, would leave him with deep psychological scars. Robert escaped Liverpool as soon as he could and moved down to London in the late 1960s. But work was not easy to come by, and even when he could find work, his behavioral problems meant his employment rarely lasted long. Robert's lack of employability was also exacerbated by his increasing reliance on hard drugs, which he used to stave off a deep and debilitating depression. It wasn't long before Robert turned to illicit means in order to support his habit. He became a male escort, frequenting London's Soho district where he propositioned those who visited the areas at many of the gay bars. Given his heterosexuality, this took a heavy toll on Robert's already failing mental health, and after several botched attempts at his own life, he was forced to seek psychiatric help. In one lengthy chat with a London-based psychiatrist, Robert confessed to hearing voices in his head, some of which implored him to murder his own parents. Naturally, the doctor talked him out of such a hideous act of violence, but it seems that Robert's thirst for a bloody revenge against a society that had continually mistreated him continued to fester within. In 1974, Robert was still selling himself in and around London when he was propositioned by a man named John Farrell. They arranged to meet in the suburb of Woodgreen, and after picking Robert up in his car and driving him to a secluded area, John began to show him a series of photographs depicting distressed young children. When Robert asked him what the purpose of this was, John Farrell replied that they were all children that he had abused at some point in the past, and that he carried photographs of them as grim trophies of his exploits. Himself, a victim of abuse, Robert Maudsley flew into a murderous rage at this revelation and strangled Farrell right there in his own car. Following the murder, Robert handed himself in to the local police, confessing to the murder and pleading for psychiatric care. It was later determined that, due to his past traumas and shattered psyche, Robert was completely unfit to stand trial and was therefore sent to Broadmoor High Security Psychiatric Hospital in the English county of Berkshire. You may be forgiven for thinking that Robert was genuinely remorseful over the murder he committed. After all, he did hand himself in over to the police. Yet the reality was that the murder had provided Robert with a deep satisfaction. 
It was the revenge he'd been craving for years by that point, and afterwards, he only wanted more. In 1977, Robert discovered that he was sharing one of Broadmoor's wings with a convicted child abuser by the name of David Francis. He then spent around two or three weeks befriending Francis, sharing cigarettes and sweets with the man until his trust was earned. Then, after luring Francis into a cell, Robert attacked him, and after restraining him with a length of torn bedsheet, Robert proceeded to torture Francis to death over the course of nine long hours. Incredibly, Robert managed to completely avoid an outright murder charge, citing his past abuse at the hands of his siblings and parents. Instead, he was convicted of manslaughter, but with a special addendum stating that he would never be released from prison. This was probably on account of the fact that Robert was completely remorseless when faced with the charge, and stated that he would kill any and all abusers of children that he encountered either in prison or on the outside. It seems this claim, while perversely righteous, was not strictly true as, by that point, Robert's thirst for blood extended well beyond those he perceived as abusers. In 1978, Robert took the lives of two of his fellow prisoners in the space of just a few hours. His first victim was Salni Darwood, a man convicted of murdering his wife. And just like with David Francis, Robert lured the man into his cell under the false pretense of sharing luxury goods with him. Once the pair were alone, Robert garroted Darwood with a piece of wire, stabbing him to death while unconscious, then attempted to hide the bloody mutilated corpse under his bed. Robert then attempted to lure a second prisoner into his cell, but not a single other person walked into his trap. His bloodlust was so great that he was no longer content to simply bait another prisoner into his room, and he began prowling the wing for more victims. Most knew to stay well enough away from Robert, whose reputation often preceded him, but one William Roberts wasn't nearly savvy enough to keep out of his way, and when Robert cornered William in the wing's recreation room, the only solace came in a quick and relatively painless death. But Robert didn't just cut William's throat and leave him to bleed out on the floor, as once he was dead, a shockingly perverse act of mutilation began. Robert began smashing William's lifeless head into a nearby wall, so many times that it cracked the man's skull wide open. It's then thought that Robert began using a makeshift knife to scoop out some of his victim's brains from his fleshy open skull before eating them raw. Robert then calmly walked into the wing's office, placed the bloody dagger on the table of the attending correctional officer, then told them that he had shortened the prisoner's roll call by two. Despite the press circulating that Robert had eaten a part of William Robert's brain, the British Press Complaints Commission cited the dead man's autopsy and claimed that this simply wasn't true. However, it's important to note that this was essentially just cover to prevent further public outcry. Not only did the autopsy reveal that the victim's skull was in such a terrible state that it was impossible to determine if the brain-eating element was true, but at least three other inmates claimed that they had personally witnessed Robert eating his victim's brains, and stated as such to the prison's warden in an attempt to keep Robert segregated from the rest of the prisoner population. Not long after the brain-eating incident, Robert was deemed too dangerous for a regular prison cell. So, in order to keep the rest of the prison population safe from him, a specialized cell was constructed in the basement of Wakefield Prison, and whenever he was outside of it, it was never to be escorted by any less than four prison officers. To keep him placated, his cell is almost double the size of a regular one, but instead of steel or concrete walls, his cell is constructed almost entirely of bulletproof glass so that his behavior can be observed at all times. The only furnishings are a table and chair, and both are made of compressed cardboard. This is because Robert has repeatedly attempted to take his own life, and anything that he could possibly use to hang himself or open a vein is strictly prohibited from being in a cell. In light of that, a solid steel door opens into a small cage within the cell, encased in thick transparent acrylic panels, with a small slot at the bottom through which officers pass him food and other items. The toilet and wash basin are bolted to the floor, while his bed is nothing but a concrete slab. 
Robert remains confined to this cell for 23 hours a day and is not allowed contact with any other inmates. Then, during his daily hour of exercise, he is escorted to the yard by six prison officers, each ready to restrain him if he suddenly attempts to take his own life in some way. In March of the year 2000, Robert begged prison staff for the terms of his solitary confinement be relaxed, but thankfully for his fellow prisoners, his request was denied. He then asked for permission to take his own life via a cyanide capsule, and again, this was denied. In a last gasp to maintain what was little left of his sanity, he asked for a pet parakeet, but prison officials were so suspicious that he might eat the poor thing alive that this request was also denied. Prisoners like Robert remind us of the quote from Richard Lee McNair, the one where he mentions prisons being a blessing on society. The idea that Robert could be free to walk among us, a man said to have eaten another's raw brains, is far more terrifying than any movie monster or campfire ghost story. Because Robert is real, and he is very, very dangerous. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Look at it anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to tip your budgerigar. <laughs>